James Arun Chaudhary, and I was the first official White House videographer, which mean, meant I did a lot of that. Uh, filming the president, you know, not making the official speeches, but the behind the scenes kind of stuff. And usually uh, the main question people have when they see something like this is, OMG, they let you do that, why? Uh, and I think the answer has a lot to uh, do with what the topic is today. It's about storytelling, you know. So often we use storytelling words when we talk about politics. We're crafting the narrative, you know, winning the day. It's a big sports competition, etc. Um, but oftentimes the people who are crafting the narrative, the political consultants, all this, you know, this class of folks, aren't the same people who actually are crafted to know how to make movies and who are you know, well versed in, in art. And so I was not just the first White House videographer, but I think I'm one of the very few actual artists working in politics, uh, which is great because when your suit doesn't quite fit right, nobody gives you a hard time and all that. <laughs> But it's also very frustrating because you do speak a, a much different language. And I think you know, the origins of my getting into this were not, where it's not a clear straight line. There wasn't a Craigslist DC listing where it was like, be the president's videographer. You know, discretion, discretion a must. Uh, it was a, a right time, right place kind of thing. Because I was uh, a not just not in politics, I was a fiction filmmaker, not on anyone's shortlist for anything. The only filmmakers who really break through into politics are usually journalists. And failing that, documentarians. Definitely not fiction filmmakers. But a certain uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton had pretty much hired up every single person who worked in democratic politics. And so the Obama campaign, by design and by necessity, had to really reach out into a lot of professional avenues. And one of the people they happened to tap was named Kate Albright Hanna, uh, who was a good friend of mine. We'd gone to a political dork camp when we were 16. And she knew that although I was this sort of you know, ne'er-do-well indie New York filmmaker, that I actually was passionate about politics and really wanted to get in there and try to tell you know, these kinds of stories. Uh, and at the heart of everything, you know, when I arrived on the scene, at the heart of any kind of story, there needs to be authenticity. And this is something we also talk about in politics a lot. You know, what is authentic? What isn't authentic? And you know, my contention, after having done this for you know, quite a long time, is that authenticity reads on camera. And American people are particularly adept at squirreling this stuff out. And so any politician, if given enough time on camera, will reveal who they are. You know, uh, oftentimes, it's very hard for the president to go by someone wearing a Barack Obama t-shirt, especially a young child, and not say, hey, nice t-shirt. It's very hard for him. That's, uh, that's a part of who he is. Uh, it didn't take you know, Mitt Romney that long to say he liked firing people on stage. It's just who he is. It's going to come out. And I think you'll find that, you know, not to be totally partisan about it, although this is not a bad city to be totally partisan about it. <laughs> Uh, you know, people reveal naturally who they are. In fact, let's be bipartisan. Another person I think who's very authentic on film would be Chris Christie. I don't know if you guys have seen the phone call where uh, someone asked him uh, where his kids go to school and his response is none of your damn business. Uh, that's worth two million hits right there. People love it, the people see it, they recognize something of themselves uh, in it. But this whole project, this whole we get to show you the president punching the Easter bunny thing, is only possible because at the heart of who Barack Obama is. Not even at who I am, but he is one of the few people, not only in politics, but a few people who I've ever met, period, who is the same on and off camera. Um, I'm gonna show you uh, some footage from the very, very beginning of the campaign at the end of my talk, and I think the thing you'll think is most remarkable about it is how much the same he is on and, on and off stage. This is about three days into, you know, it was the longest campaign in the history of the universe in perpetuity. Uh, but he was exactly the same, but it was other people who kind of came around to this idea of it being a good thing. You know, the very first thing I shot, this clip that you'll see, after the camera went off, the Iowa campaign manager was like, and who are you guys, you know, filming? This is Chris Northcross. Uh, it wasn't actually myself filming. I hadn't been in the campaign yet. And he was like, I'm with the campaign, to which the Iowa campaign manager responded, which campaign? <laughs> so. It wasn't until people really started to see some of the footage coming in and realizing, oh, this person is exactly the same on camera as he is off camera, and all that's really happening is we have a new way in which uh, a public official can speak to the public. I mean, you have very limited options when you're a public official on how you can interact with the public. You can make a speech, you can give an interview, you can do a press conference, you can do a direct to camera, that's when you look right down the hatch and you're like, we are about to commence bombing and all that stuff. Or you have this other way we're talking about, this kind of casual way. And when you have an additional way to say something, it allows you to say the same thing more often without becoming super duper annoying. Because if you say the same thing five times, you know, it's kind of like talk radio, you know, you kind of hammers it in, but 
there's some collateral damage to all of our psyches. But if you can say the same thing five different ways, not only is it, a, I think, a softer entrance in, but it becomes more of a narrative experience and more you know, of a story, which is what we're here to talk about. And most importantly, it allows us to show and not to tell what's going on because the old adage of politics is when you're explaining, you're losing. And it's absolutely the case. You know, there have been a lot of critiques of how things go. And this is only my second election that I'm really heavily involved in. And I'm already this like jaded old guy. And I see it all. And you, you hear the donors, your Facebook friends, especially your super liberal Facebook friends. I think if you could just explain, I think people would really get it. And you're like, is that true? That doesn't ever seem to be true. Even people who seem to know better you know, like your Chris Matthews is and all them. Like after the debate, they were like, the president should have explained A, B, C. Well, the president shouldn't have looked down. But the president should have explained A, B, C, D. And you're like, that doesn't sound like something the president should have done at all. Uh, and I think this is a great classic example. I want to show you an old, uh, an old ad from the 1972 election that if explaining, if the narrative wasn't important, if just the facts were important, would be the most successful ad of all time. This is about the government. This is about credibility. This is about electronics. This is about bugging. This is about spying. This is about thievery. This is about espionage. This is about lying. This is about payoffs. This is about contradiction. This is about special deals. This is about falsification. This is about testimony. This is about wheat deals. This is about hiding. This is about dishonesty. This is about sabotage. This is about secrecy. This is about stealing. This is about hidden funds. This is about deception. This is about the White House. And this is how you stop it, with your vote. So people forget that Watergate had already full on broken during the election and the facts were out $700 and you know, $1,000 in a briefcase. All this stuff was out there, all these damning facts were out there. But there was no real narrative way to put it together yet and explaining it to folks in a way that sometimes I would call you know, idea sashimi, just kind of like serving it up, uh, didn't seem to work. As you recall, McGovern did not win that election. President McGovern did not, his administration was very short. Uh, and so I think you can really see that the, you know, the bankruptcy uh, of this kind of idea. And it's also something that I think as a public, we're not really looking for. We want to know what our guys are like, what our, you know, our, our leaders, what they're, what they're into, how they work, how you know, look under the hood is the way the president used to describe it in Iowa. You know, folks, they really like to kick in the tires and see what's going on. And when you can give them you know, an introduction to someone like the way we did in 2008 with Barack Obama, it also helps um, you know, mitigate Sometimes, you know, when do people do come at you with lies and smears and stuff, if you are well introduced, there's a great amount of material out there. Uh, I think it's important. And uh, the same principle in terms of when I went to the White House and then we were governing definitely, definitely uh, applied. It's not just about having the cool Easter Bunny stuff. It's about putting lots of things out all the time. Transparency is a discipline. You know, it's not a home run. You'd have to go in all the time and do it. And my best example of when that happened was during the uh, oil spill on the Gulf Coast. And we were down there a lot, so much so that actually someone was like, hey, you should make a whole movie just about uh, the oil spill. And so I kind of broke off in the president's bubble and just learned a lot about how it was going on and put together a piece. Now, the most fascinating part of it was when we were in NOAA headquarters, someplace Mississippi, and they were testing to see if the fish was going to be safe to eat. They have this amazing Dr. Seuss machine, you know, and they put the fish in and it's like, ding, yes, you know, or red, like, no. <laughs> but then next to that, was, and I forget, I think his first name was Jerry, but Jerry had a team of fish sniffers. This is the truth. And they uh, would put a fillet of the fish in this ice or the bucket, towel over the head, and they would sense how much petroleum there was in it. And they are 1,000 times more accurate than the machine. I mean, you know, the human body is an amazing thing, and I don't think it's that far-fetched to believe it. However, in my little movie about what the federal government was doing to mitigate the problems of this oil spill, I couldn't be like, hey, nobody worry about the seafood. We got the fish sniffing team on it. I know you've never heard of them before, but they're so good, watch my movie. But if Noah had been putting out something every week, like, you know, amazing things in the ocean you have no idea about, like, then probably, I'm sure, episode three or four would have been the fish sniffing team. And then you point back to it and say, 
this is something that's real, and we've been sharing this stuff with you even when you weren't asking. And I think that is also about narrative, storytelling, and politics. It's about giving information even when people aren't necessarily asking. It's not always a response. The 24-hour news cycle is such a back and forth, the crazy response thing. And you know, the more I think people dig up, uh, and I think effectively, by putting out so much material on a regular basis, we have introduced Barack Obama to the public in a way that it makes it hard for people to, you know, they're always coming up with this old footage and saying, isn't this crazy, saying something about Marxism or something about this. I think because we put so much material out there, people are most struck by how much the same he is 1998, how much the same he is in 2012. And so I did want to show you uh, this piece that we never put out. It's from day three of the campaign, so very early 2007. So this is Reggie. Reggie played basketball and football for Duke. Actually tried out for the Dallas Cowboys. And the Packers. And the Packers. Uh, concluded that uh, he was better off uh, in a political career because uh, although this is a contact sport, you don't break bones in politics. So, Reggie, you have something to say to the camera? This has been a great experience, and politics, unlike sports, you have a, a longer career, you still have to listen to people yell at you, uh, <laughs> and you still have to, and you still have to try to make everyone as happy as possible. This is Paul Toos. Played Division Three football. Played Division Three football. <laughs> um, he is sort of our coach here in Iowa and, and has a similar temperament to Bill Purcells. What does that mean? You know, he's, he's a little grumpy and, and uh, you know, I think that's who Reggie was referring to when he talks about getting yelled at. Okay, never yell. No, he, he actually keeps a, a, a low demeanor, but, uh, but there's an edge to him, you know. Did you guys put this up? Is that what you're yeah. yeah. <laughs> no whining. <laughs> it's actually a pretty good philosophy. It sums up a lot. No whining. You, you, you could do worse than just living by the philosophy, mm -hmm. no whining. You know? It's contagious. Give a warm muscatine welcome to our next president, Senator Barack Obama. Hey! Thank you guys so much.